So when does this thing? <laughs> Technical difficulties. Yeah, okay, wonderful. So uh, welcome to the Free and the Furious. Uh, as Sergio said before, I'm Raichu. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm basically one of those nut jobs who's compiling uh, Idris to JavaScript and stuff like that, and also work in a day job writing Haskell, getting money from that, so yeah. Um, so this talk, as the title implies, is about performance and stuff like that and free monads. And uh, I'm hopefully going to introduce everything you need to know to, to understand what's going on here. If you have a question, just shoot at me. Uh, not literally, but uh, ask questions. Uh, because I think I have enough time to, to cover everything. So yeah, um, yeah let's get started. Uh, actually, I want to start with a, with a, with a little anecdote here. Um, when, the, when Sergio asked me if I wanted to give a talk at this conference, I wasn't quite sure what to talk about. Um, there were a lot of things on my mind, and Codensity was definitely one of them, but I didn't know if, if, if you folks fi would find that interesting or if it maybe was too complicated or too academic for some reason. But yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure. So uh, then I stumbled across this, this uh, little thread on, on Reddit. Uh, sorry, I read Reddit sometime. Everyone makes mistakes. Uh, so um, there's this one thread on the OCaml subreddit, which was basically called, What are OCaml's critiques of Haskell? And there was one comment that I found particularly interesting in which the author stated that Haskell's are Yoneda crazy. So if you don't know what Yoneda is, it's, it's a lemma from elementary category theory. I think it's been mentioned a lot of times during today. Um, so yeah, so basically the author is implying that everyone is using Haskell's category theory crazy, uh, which is certainly true to some extent. I am for sure, I like that stuff, but uh, I'm not as good as I'd like to be in it. So. Well, in this, uh, in this comment, the author says, I know Haskell, I know some category theory, but I'm highly skeptical that teaching the Yoneda Lemma to C++ programmers is actually useful in any way. I'm worried that we may have a backlash at some point when you know, people realize that unless your initials are EK, you're wasting your time thinking about the Codensity transformation. And at that point, I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if I were to travel across Europe and people pay me for that, and I were able to waste your collective time to think about the Codensity transformation. Wouldn't that be neat? Um, and that pretty much sold me on the idea uh, that Codensity was the topic I wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah, but all jokes aside, uh, whenever you're introducing something from abstract mathematics, uh, you should have some reason or some kind of motivation to convince the audience, which will be you in this case, that this is actually something very useful to know. And uh, I want to do that. And to do that, I prepared this little appetizer for you. So by the end of the talk, we will implement a very small programming language. I think Raul did something similar in his talk. Um, we will be using the free monad to do that. Uh, we will implement a programming language that is called Teletype. Um, it doesn't do anything interesting. Uh, it just consumes input and writes output. It's very, very simple what this language does. And we're, we will be using free monads, and the nice thing about free monads is that you can separate syntax from semantics, so we can have different interpreters to, to, to basically evaluate our program. So what we are going to do is um, we will write a very simple program in Teletype, which is called Ref Echo. And what Ref Echo does is it consumes characters until it reaches a space, and then it will reverse everything it consumed up until that point. So very simple program. And here you can see I'm, I'm doing run pure ref echo input. And run pure is our interpreter, so it doesn't do any side effects. That's a good thing, so it's very testable in this case. Ref echo is the program that I just talked about, and we've got input. And input is just a stream of 10,000 characters, then a space, and then it go, just goes on. So we are going to consume 10,000 characters and then reverse them. And as you can see, the performance is, uh, well, it's not good. It takes 71 seconds to, to complete, and it takes a lot of memory. So that shouldn't really happen if we're just, con we're just reversing uh, 10,000 characters. So something is, is going wrong here. So as you may guess, Codensity is going to be the tool that we're using to solve this problem. And one of the neat things about Codensity is that it gives us a very nice little combinator, which is called improve. It can sprinkle throughout your code base. 
and good stuff will happen. Magic. It's not really magic. I'm going to explain how it works. Um, not the mathematics behind it, but I could if you want to know. We have a whiteboard and coffee. So yeah. <laughs> so let's let's put that thing into action. And yeah. So, so here I'm using that. I'm I'm omitting the the performance, so I get some tension in here. So the only thing I did was. I added and improved. Everything else is the same. I didn't touch ref echo. The interpreter is the same. Input is the same. I'm not cheating here. So maybe maybe the performance gets a little bit better here. So let's let's look at it. What what's the performance of that thing? It's a little bit faster. Um, so now it takes just 700 milliseconds to complete. That's well orders of magnitude we're talking about here. Um, yeah. So there there must be something deeply magical going on here and. If this doesn't convince you that cadensity is something that is actually useful, I don't know what does. I mean, that's, that, is, that is like something that hap can happen in real code. And I will show you what's going on there. So yeah, let's talk about what we are going to talk about today. Um, so I'll outline. And the first thing I will talk about is lists and monoids. So why lists and monoids? I'm going to use something that hopefully everyone in this room knows to emulate the pro problem that we just saw. So we're going to analyze the problem in terms of a language that everyone is familiar with in this room. And I'm also going to introduce monoids, which are a very simple algebraic structure, and a lot of people have talked about this today. So I'm going to reiterate this once again so everyone totally understands what this thing is. Yeah. OK, and then we want to solve this problem. We want to. After we emulate this problem, we want to we want to get our performance back, and I'm going to do this by introducing something that's called a delist or difference list. Um, delists are basically just a different representation of lists. So that that's that's just the thing. They they were invented like by John Hughes somewhere in the 1980s. Uh, that's not important for that. Nice trivia. So we are going to use that thing to solve that problem. After that, I'm going to recap what free monads are. So if you don't know what they are, um, some people have spoken about them today. I'm going to explain a little bit more about them. I w maybe I will explain what this free means uh, in terms of category theories. <laughs> um, it's, it's not that hard, but yeah. So if you don't know what they are, um, here's your chance. And after that, I will recover the notion of a list using the free monad. Uh, and I'm going to do that to basically reconstruct the same problem that we had up there, and we want to solve this, but for the free monad. And what's interesting about this, then, when we, as we've solved that, we will have a tool to do this for basically every free monad. So we've abstracted that problem. Abstraction is always a good thing. Um, and as you might guess, that is cadensity. So that's, that's the goal. And after that, we will implement teletype and look at the same problem once again, and then we will improve it. So that's the outline. So you got a rough plan in your head what I'm aiming at. So yeah. So this is a little motivation example. And a this is a warning. Um, this is not super great Haskell code. This is code that hopefully everyone in here can understand. And um, yeah, so uh, I want to see, I, I want to give you code where you can exactly see what's going on, wh what's going wrong, what's going right. So this is the idea of this code. So we will see this example throughout the talk over and over again with different tools. Th that's going to be the idea. So you can always see what's the diff between these, these, these kind of implementations. So yeah, um, let's get started here. This is what, what does this program do? Well, it's, it's, uh, it counts down from 20,000. And with every iteration of proc prime, we just write the number that we're currently at into a log, and once we've reached zero, we're going to return that log. And in the end, I will just take the last entry of that log and return that, which should hopefully be one. But it's not really interesting what the output of this program is. What's interesting is the performance. And yeah, let's let's just run that and figure out what's going wrong. Yeah, 18 seconds. 18 seconds to count down from 20,000. Um, you can guess that's not very good. Uh, especially if you think that Haskell is a very fast language, and why does it take 18 seconds to complete, and why does it consume a lot of memory? So something's obviously going wrong here. 
and um, the seasoned Haskell programmer in the audience will definitely spot what's fishy here. So it's, it's, it's basically this part of the code. So if you know what append does, append basically recurses on the left-hand side until it reaches the base cage, which is the empty list. And then it puts whatever's on the right-hand side at the end of the list. So you may see what's going wrong here. Every iteration is going to completely traverse the lock over and over and over and over again. So that's, that's where we are burning a lot of, of CPU cycles and consuming a lot of memory because we are producing a lot of intermediate lists that we're just going to throw away. So you might think, well, maybe a list is, is, is the completely wrong data structure to solve this problem or to, to approach this problem, and it surely is in this case, but it's, it's a good example. So um, yeah, may, may, maybe you say, okay, let's just take a different, different data structure here. But um, let's look at this problem a little bit more deeply. So imagine you have three lists. You have X's, Y's, and Z's, and you want to concatenate them together. So we could do that in different ways, but I the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to do it this way, because this is actually how this program uh, produces this kind of lock. So first we have X's, and then we have Y's. We're going to concatenate them together. So we have traverse X first, then we append Y's. Now we want to append Z's. So what happens? We traverse that thing once again. That's bad. That's, that's the problem that we're seeing here. And it would be a lot better if we could write it that way. We're just shifting the parentheses. So no deep magic going on here. So now what's happening is we're just traversing X once. So obviously this is the more efficient way, but will it give the same result? Duh, you might say it's a list, of course it will give the same result. But um, I want to talk this a little bit in a more general way than okay, this is a list so we can do that. And if you paid attention to the, uh, some other talks here, you will see that this is probably tackled best for the monoid. Um, so what's a monoid? Uh, in, in Haskell, we got this little uh, neat type class which represents a monoid. And uh, I'm just going to talk about two little methods here. I'm talking about memty and uh, mepend. We, we pronounce that mepend. It sounds odd, but it's some sort of multiplication. So we got memty, which is a neutral element of some set A, and we got mapend, which is some sort of multiplication. So what's going on here, we can take two elements from our set A, we can multiply them together, and then we get something that is still an A. So this is what's going on there. Um, well, to have a monoid, that's not enough. We need to satisfy certain laws. So there are two laws that we need to satisfy. And the first one is whenever you have an element A, uh, excess of the set A, and you multiply it with a neutral element, you should get the same element out. The neutral element shouldn't do anything when you do multiplication there. And it doesn't matter if you do that from the left or from the right. So that's the law that we need to satisfy. Very simple law. And the second one is if we've got three elements, x's, y's, and z's, then it doesn't matter where we put the parentheses. Uh -huh. Aha. That's, that, that's exactly what we want. So we want to be able to shift our parentheses in our multiplication to the right. We want to be able to do that. And obviously, a monoid gives us that possibility to do that, so we can just have the same problem. And conveniently enough, lists give rise to a monoid. So the empty element is the empty list, and mapend is just list append. So great, this, this should work. Now we just have to find out how we can statically guarantee that we shift all these parentheses to the right. And I'm going to do this by introducing a D-list. So as I said before, a D-list is an alternative representation of a list. And as you can see, if you can read a little bit of Haskell, it's, it's essentially just a function from list of A to list of A. That's a D-list. So what is this argument that we feed into the D-list? What, what could that be? Well, it's basically the end of the list. So what we're doing here is something that's called a continuation passing style transformation. So we're passing in all just the end of the list to get our result back out. And we can do, use, that, uh, use that, rep uh, that representation to build our basic functions that we know. We can use, we can use empty, uh, we can write empty to, to give us an empty D list, and that's essentially just the identity function. We feed in the empty list, and the result will be the empty list once again. We can have singleton, 
which just takes an A, something of type A, and what, what it does is just cons this X to the front of the argument. So, once again, very simple. The next function that we have is append. And that is very interesting because that thing is just function composition. Which, so we just have, we have, we have two, lead, two D lists, X's and Y's, we compose them together, and what we get is, well, the, the appended list, the appended D list. And another interesting observation that you might, have, might, might see here, um, all of these operations just take constant time. Even the append operation takes constant time. So it's not linear time like in the, in, in the other case when we had to traverse um, the, the left-hand side of append. So there's something interesting going on here. This, this, this is good. Um, so in the end, we want to get back out the list. As I said before, we're just passing in the empty list and then we get the result. So okay. And conveniently enough, the list also give rise to a monoid. So there seems to be going, uh, some, something neat going on here. So let's put that thing into action. So here I'm using the, the overloaded lists uh, language extension, which is basically just, it, it enables me to use a list syntax for DList, so it looks a little bit nicer. Um, I'm also using a, a package with its own package, um, which is called DList, obviously, uh, and it just has all that stuff that we need in there, so you don't have to write that yourself. So now our log is not a list of strings, it's a DList of strings. And the only thing that we've changed here is this to list operation to get our list back out, and we're using this mapend multiplication on that. But that's everything that we changed. So not, not much change. Let's, let's, let's look at the performance. Oops, it's okay. <laughs> I can work in the dark. <laughs> okay, um, I didn't, well, didn't notice that. Okay. What you see here, it, now it just takes 20 milliseconds. Remember, it took 18 before that. So this is good. We, we, we got a lot out there. And it, it also, it also uh, consumes less memory, once again. So yeah, we solved that problem. We solved it for, for lists. But now let's move on to free monads because we're not here to talk about lists. So yeah, free monads. Um, what are free monads? Uh, first of all, I, wanna, I, I didn't say something about this list monoid that I started out with. The list monoid is basically a very, very special monoid. And um, what do you need to do to get uh, a monoid when you have a certain type, an arbitrary type? Um, well, you just feed it into a list, and then you automatically get a monoid. So the interesting thing here is that I can take some arbitrary type and generate a monoid out of nothing. So this is, this is what we call the free monoid in Haskell, or in category theory, to be precise. Um, so this notion of freeness is, is a categorical one. It's not like free beer or something like that. It has actually meaning. Um, so yeah, now, now I'll get to switch to the whiteboard. Um, I, I wanna explain to you what this notion of freeness means. And it's, it's, it's a little bit involved, but the idea is pretty simple. So up here, we have, so let's call it this the land of monoids. We call this mon. So the category theorist in this room are already snickering, I guess. So what we can do with a monoid is that we can basically forget that it's a monoid. And then it's just a set. So all we're doing is we're forgetting about that there are special operations in there, there is the neutral element. We just forget that. And what we end up with is something that lives down here in the world of sets. We call that set. So this process of forgetting something can be modeled in category by using something that's called a functor. I hope you know what a functor is because that's basically what I presume now. <laughs> so we're using that functor here and it goes down there. It just forgets everything. And we call that the forgetful functor, which is naturally denoted by the letter U. <laughs> yeah, category theory. So it, it means <laughs> underlying. It's the underlying functor. So can we get back up there? Can we do that? Yes, I told you how to do that. We just, we just build a list, we just build a string of words, and we can go back up there. And that's the free functor, and to, uh, we don't want to confuse it with the forgetful functor, so we call that one F. 
I didn't make this up. <laughs> so mathematicians are weird. So what we're looking at here is something that we call an adjunction in category theory. And we denoted with this uh, fallen over T turnstile. So what free means, what a free functor is, it's basically this left thing. If, if it is on the left-hand side of such a thing, where the right-hand side is something that is this forgetful functor, then we get something that's called the free functor. And that is, it, it's not free as in beer, it's free as in left adjoint. So this is called the left adjoint for obvious reasons, and this is called the right adjoint. So just to get this kind of, well, terminology out of the way. Um, maybe you don't find this interesting, but I do. So what's a free monoid then, a free monad then? Well, it's, it's, it's the same idea that up here we've got monads, and we forget about that they're actually monads, and what we end up with is a functor. So we, monad, functor, can we go back up there? Yes, we can. Uh, and that is basically the free construction that we see over there. So take some f, which is a functor, an arbitrary functor, we don't care what it is. Put it in there, and what you get is a monad. So you can see that with this instance. We have some functor f, we don't care about what it is. And we can write this monad instance for free. So this is the same concept. In, in the list case, we had an arbitrary type A. Here we have an arbitrary functor f. So we get that thing out. So don't pay too much attention about the implementation here. I'm using typed holes to write these things. And the good thing about this is that the types direct you into the correct way. That's, that's a pretty cool thing. So it, the types kind of force you to write this kind of implementation, which is pretty neat. So now what we need is, is an, uh, um, a function to lift something that is in our functor, uh, f, some fa, where f is a functor. We want to be able to lift that into free fa. So that's also a function. I mean, that, that, that's kind of simple here. But we're going to, we're going to um, generalize that thing later. So keep that a little bit in mind. So this is going to be generalized in the future, and this is going to get important. OK. Um, let's recover the notion of a list here. So what kind of functor do we need to feed into our free construction um, when we want to get a list back out? If you guess the list functor, then you're wrong. And I, I've, I've been wrong with this at first. Why, why, why not the list functor? Because it would give you a different monad. Here we have to use a different monad. What I'm, what I'm basically using is um, the, the functor where, think about a tuple. You have A and B, and you're using all functions on this part of the tuple. So that obviously yields a functor as well. So yeah, we're going to use that. And now we need to get our list back out of that free construction. Um, so run pure, this, this underscore, um, at that point, there would only be unit, so I left that out because that's not important. We use unit to, we use unit to denote the, the end of the list. So when we run that, we get the empty list back out. When we run that, we just take x, put it in front of a new list, we take axis, which is the tail. We run our construct, uh, run again, and we, well, we construct that list once again. So now we build the empty list, uh, which is this pure unit. Um, we use list f, uh, lift f to build our singleton list, and so on and so on. And what's interesting, append is just monadic bind. If you don't believe me, that's a nice exercise for home, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, you, you can use monadic bind to, to concatenate two lists together. Um, this is going to, and this is going to be important when we want to uh, solve our problem. So let's run this. So once again, we use our little program here. We use that free thing that I just talked about as our, our list. So this is basically just a list of strings, just very complicated. Um, what we do here, we run a pan, uh, we, uh, run this thing so we get the list back out. Excuse me. And here we use append and single. So it's, it's once again the same program. So let's run that. Great Scott. That, <laughs> that is even worse. So we complicated things a lot and 
we miserably failed. It, I mean, this performance is abysmal. I mean, 145 seconds to complete the same program. And memory, I don't want to talk about that. It, that is, that, uh, something's going really, really wrong here, even more wrong than before. So obviously, this is going wrong again. It's, it, everything is nested to the left, and we want that. So we, once again, need to statically guarantee that everything is associated to the right. So yeah, but first let's look at the problem that we actually have in here. Why is this even worse than the examples that we had before? And to understand that, we need to understand monadic bind a little bit better. This is why append and the monadic bind thing is important. Um, basically, we can think of bind as substitution and then normalization. Okay, what does that mean? So let's think we have monad MA. So monad M and we have something, some A in there. What we do then is we substitute all the elements A with this function. So what we get then is an MMB. That's not what we want. We wanted an MB. So we need to squash these two M's together. And that process is called normalization. So we squash these things together. So to implement that, we basically just used fmap, which is our map for the style people. We call that thing fmap, um, to, to, um, to substitute. And then we use join to flatten that thing. You, you call that thing flatten, I believe. So let's look at the join implementation. So this is just like a little bit of pseudocode here. Um, well, it's actual Haskell, but it, in this case, it's just, uh, just a comment. So let's look at join in terms of pure. So pure is pretty simple. We got, uh, remember, we got an MMA here. So this is an MA. We just pull that out. It's problem solved. But let's look at this one. See anything weird going on here? It's not really getting smaller, isn't it? You know, we're recursively calling all that thing and put three on the front. That, that, that's bad. So what's happening here is bind in a free monad is only defined in terms of substitution. It doesn't really normalize. So this thing grows with every bind that we're doing. So now we've got even better reasons to reassociate that thing because it's growing. And we, we have to traverse even bigger trees in this case every time. So we need to do that kind of transformation that we talked about. We need to shift the parentheses to the right. And can we do that? Um, so to understand that, that we can do that, we have to look at the monad laws, which also have been mentioned before. So let's look at this, this little law here. We have return A, we bind it to F, and we get an FA back up. So what return does, it sort of acts like some sort of neutral element here. So it doesn't really do anything if I put return on this side. So this is the, like the left identity in this case. So if we do that to the right-hand side, well, we get the same result. So return is acting like some sort of, of uh, well, yeah, neutral element there. Because this sentence was also mentioned today, a monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. If you don't know what that means, that's perfectly OK. But there is some part of the sentence that should resonate with you. A monad is a monoid. So as I said before, these laws, they, they look pretty, pretty similar to what, what was going on with a with monoid. And that's not a coincidence, as you might guess. Um, so here, that's just the associativity law going on there. We need a lambda here, so that looks a little bit ugly. But basically, that's just shifting the parentheses to the right hand side once again. So we can do that with a monad. This, this, the laws hold. The laws tell us that we can do that. This is why laws are very important. We usually omit them when we're speaking about things like that, which I think is kind of sad <laughs> because they are really, really, really the meat of the problem. So yeah, now it's time for cadensity. So this is probably one of the hardest slides. Not, well, not really, but uh, it will come. So. I'm using another language extension here, which is called rank n types. You can emulate them in Scala as well. Rank n types are, you have some sort of higher order polymorphism. So what's happening here is that this part here of our record, um, or a new type in this case, that is polymorphic in B. So we can have arguments that are polymorphic as well, which is a pretty neat thing. Um, so 
with the dealers at the, uh, we fed in this neutral element at the end, the empty list, as you might recall. We had this to list function and we, we fed in, uh, what it did is basically just talk, took the dealers and put in the empty list, our neutral element in there. So over here we're doing the same thing. We're taking the C and we're feeding in our neutral element that we just had to, to get our MA back out. So this types the signature, it matches perfectly with return as you can see. Once again, that's not a coincidence. So this thing gives us the static guarantee that everything is associated to the right because this once again is a, a continuation passing star transformation. Even more <laughs> like the example than before uh, because we, if we look at the implementation of that thing, so that looks horrible, I know, this is my like dot, 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 this, oh my God, what's that? Um, the thing is, these implementations are basically equivalent to uh, the implementation of the continuation monad. That's the same thing. We can use the same code here, we can reuse that. Uh, and I'll also use type holes to write them, so I, I cannot do this stuff in my head, to be honest, not for the life of me. So there's also another interesting fact here with this instance. So codensity f is always a monad, no matter what f is. So it's not like the free thing where f had to be a functor. So here we, get, we always get a monad. It's also something that we might want to consider. Also pretty interesting. I'm not going to into depth uh, in this talk about this, but just want to mention that. So this is, well, maybe this is the hardest slide. <laughs> so um, now what I want to do is I want to abstract over this free constructor. So if you look at the type signature, we just have an F, M, A, and we want to wrap that up to get an M, A back out. So basically all it does, it's abstract, it, it, it abstracts over this free thing here. So we got a function that's called wrap. And this, the interesting part about this slide is this instance. Because what it tells me is that if we've got an M and an F and we've got a monad free instance for that thing, we should be able, we, we should all also have an, a codensity instance for that thing. So that thing comes for free. Give me any, anything that's a monad free and I can wrap it in codensity it's, and, and will, it will be a monad free. So that, that's a good thing. And we will see later why that is a good thing. So as I said before, I'm going to generalize lift f here. So as, as you might remember, this thing was free. We abstracted over that. Now we just say wrap. And this was uppercase pure, now it's lowercase pure. But it's the same thing. So this is the, this is the same function, only more in a, in a generalized way. So we can use this on any, um, any monad free thing now. So once again, we are recovering, recovering the lists here. Uh, and I'm too small to, basically point to the only thing that changed in that slide because it's only that codensity thing up there. That, that, is, that is the only thing that changed. I just added codensity. And all this code is basically the same. Not, not a single letter changed in that. So yeah, let's run that thing. So once again, we use that list and yeah, put that into action. And it just takes 18 milliseconds to complete. So, yay, we solved the problem. So the D list is still faster, but now we've got a solution that covers all the free monads that we have. So that, that's a very, really good thing now. We have, we've got all the tools that we need to solve and understand our problem. So let's implement this teletype language that I've, just, that I've been talking about. So teletype has two operations. We can put a character on some output and we can read a character from some input. And what this K is, this is once again just the continuation, the next, the next operation in our imperative program that we're going to build up later. So this thing is, well, I'm going to say something mean here, it's obviously a functor. It's, uh, if you wanna know why that is, you can write the instance, but I'm, I'm just lazy, I'm going to use the derive functor language extension from, from Haskell. So I can just write derive functor and it just comes for free, which is pretty cool. Saves me some boilerplate. And then I'm going to build our free monad. So I'll just write teletype A, blah, 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 blah. Free teletype A. So now I've got a monad. 
So this is the way you should use, or would usually do that. But I'm going to change it a little bit. I want to be this thing to be a little bit more general. And I'm going to write this ugly monster. Um, so what this thing does, it basically tells me, well, I'll basically tell the compiler, look, I don't care what this M, uh, M thing is. It should only be something of, the, uh, it should have an instance like that. It should be monad free. F should be teletype F, and I don't care what this M is. So it could be just free, or it could be this codensity thing, or anything else that we come up with a uh, useful um, instance. So yeah, that, that is good. So it, this thing enables me that I can choose my instance at evaluation for, at the call side of my program. That is crucial, and we will see, it, you saw that before, but we will see that in action. Um, so now let's write the, the, the functions. So get char is essentially just we read that input, uh, put char, just writes that thing to the whatever we are using in the interpreter. And this is, this is, this is our problem child here, ref echo. Um, so what ref echo does, it consumes a character from the input. It checks if it's not um, a space and this thing gets executed when this thing, uh, thing is true. So we call ref echo recursively, and then we call put char. So you can see here, if, you, if, if we substitute ref echo over and over again, everything once again is less nested to the left. That is exactly the problem that we had before. This is why this performance was so bad. And actually let's, I don't know if I can pull this up. Yes, I can. Great. So let's just run that. I just want to show you how that really looks like when you do that. Input. So yeah. So this this takes some time. It's and I, I will not stand here for a minute and watch read 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 going to pass by. This is just yeah. This is the problem that we we saw. So yeah, let's let's yeah maybe no, let's just use use that. Oh, damn it. So let's just try this improve operation here that I was talking about. Improve. So yeah. Done. So. Whoops. <laughs> As you can see, oh, this is even faster than my benchmark. Right. Uh, so now this just takes um, 53 milliseconds. So it completes really, really fast. So this improve function. As you, see, uh, as you saw, this was the same program. I, the only thing I changed was improve. So what is this thing? It has to be a super complicated function. It does magical stuff, don't you think? It has to be very, very complicated. So brace yourself. I'm not going to show you the implementation of this complicated function. It's going to blow your mind. It's so complicated. It's basically just lower codensity. That's, that's the thing when we pass in that neutral element. So yeah, this type signature is once again pretty weird, but um, it, just like before, it, it, what it says is, look, I don't care what this M is. It just has to be something of monad free. And yeah, that, that, is, that is pretty much the magic that's going on there. So yeah, I don't, it's a, if, if you've got any questions, throw at me, but OK. Um, yeah. So if you want to learn a little bit more about this stuff, uh, there is uh, this dealers package that I use. So you don't have to build this stuff yourself. I actually did for this presentation. So everything I, I, I showed you here, that's my implementation. I didn't use a library because, yeah, I needed the code to be a little bit more readable than, than library code. Sometimes they do word optimization stuff and things get ugly. So yeah, um, you can use the free library to do all your free monad goodness. And then you got this evil sounding library which is called can extensions. Um, and that contains stuff like uh, Codensity and Coyonata and all, all the good stuff that we need to do funky, funky transformations and f funky cool stuff with, with uh, free monads and other things. So if you feel so inclined and are uh, into Idris, um, during the preparation of this talk, I also wrote uh, a little library which is called, uh, inappropriately called Idris Free. Uh, it's inappropriate because it also contains some can extensions and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, now that you've seen my talk, you can probably, you, you, you could write some documentation for that. I would be pretty thankful because I'm a very lazy person. 
Um, so yeah, the funny thing is that didn't work when I started preparing this talk. The compiler simply wouldn't swallow it. So thankfully, Edwin fixed that, and now you can have codensity and all the goodness in your Idris code. But there are some other interesting problems that we might talk, uh, talk over later in the pop or whatever. So the canonical paper on this, on this topic is called Asymptotic Improvement of Computations over Free Monads. Now that's a mouthful. But um, I, I it used this paper to, to basically steal the ref echo um, example. So I'm not, I, I didn't come up with that. All credits go to Janis Poglender. And if you're more into blog posts, I can recommend um, the blog post by Edward Komet, Monads for Free. It's, it's, I think it's like three or four parts. But if you just want to understand what I talked about today, um, the first one is probably the best in my opinion. So uh, the other one go into weird stuff like church encodings and uh, maybe you don't want to go there. It's, it's, it's well, weird. Anyway, um, so I only took 40 minutes, but basically I took 40 minutes to explain you why shifting parentheses from the left to the right is a good idea using fancy mathematics. Um, it's essentially everything that we did. I, I, it looks complicated, but that's the basic idea. If, if that's all you take away from this talk, then you understood what Codensity does. And you can impress all your coworkers with using all these weird words that I use today. So, <laughs> or annoy them as I do. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for your attention and are there any questions? <laughs> yeah.